Ray Bradbury was the first professional writer who ever told me that my work was worth pursuing. You know, I, I understand that you had the opportunity there to study with Octavia Butler as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, of um, course. Stanislaw Lem. I mean, Lem, Lem and Dick make an interesting pairing because they hated one another. And Lem was very angry about Dick. And Dick was very paranoid about Lem. Hi, I'm Michael Leverts, and this is Fit to be Read. <laughs> This episode is most definitely not about me, so let's get straight to it and hear from some really amazing authors about the icons who have influenced them or even with whom they have some history. Even if Stephen Barnes' story about Ray Bradbury chokes you up like it did me, stick around for some thoughts on Butler, Dick, Lem, Delaney, Asimov, Heinlein, Clark, Niven, and Le Guin, and more. That really calls to mind for me the, uh, and I, I'm curious if you've read this the book or if it had any part of influence on you was uh, a short story by Ray Bradbury, uh, part of the illustrated man um, where the, uh, uh, it is. Um, That's the one where the black people leave, leave the planet and go to Mars. Oh, on Mars. And then the white people then want to come with their rockets and, and come in and sort of, you know, roll. Sure, over I read it. You know, Ray, Ray was, a, I mean, Ray was one of the most important authors uh, of my life, and I have I have history with him, um, but he was also a man of his time. So he was doing some remarkable things in just asking those questions. But you know, it really it wasn't asking the same set of questions. You know, it was you know black people as poor and downtrodden and so forth. But he was uh, he was an amazing human being. Ray Bradbury was the first professional writer who ever told me that my work was worth pursuing. Uh, I wrote a story called, uh, I was taking a, a writing class at UCLA from the literary editor of the, of the LA Times, Robert Kirsch. And I wrote a story called, uh, no, 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 no. I have to go back further than that, I think. Do I have to go back further than that? Yeah, I need to go back further than that to um, a story that I wrote called Trick or Treat. It's a Halloween story. And I took it to a Ray Bradbury. My, my girlfriend at the time, Tony, did up a, a cover for me. It was very nice and Halloweeny. And I went to a Ray Bradbury signing and I gave him a copy of it. And about six weeks later, I got this lovely note back from him telling saying you know that that he thought that it was a scary story and i should keep writing then years later i was taking a class at ucla extension from uh, robert kirsch who was a literary editor of the la times and i wrote a a store science fiction story about a compulsive gambler who hawks his pacemaker and uh he read this story and he said you know i have a friend would you mind if I showed this story to my friend? I said, sure. And about five weeks later, I got another letter from Ray Bradbury saying, you know, um, you know, that he liked that story and that I, I should pursue it. Um, years later, I was the moderator at Planet Fest, the Planetary Society's thing out in Pasadena. And uh, Bradbury was one of the speakers. And he... Uh, he came up on stage and I got to tell the story about, about how he had contributed to my career. And he gave me a hug on stage and everybody applauded. That was very sweet. Um, then later on, I did a science fiction symposium at UCLA where every week I would have another writer come. Robert Block came and so forth and so on. And uh, I met Bradbury in Westwood for dinner. I actually picked him up at his house and, and we had dinner in in Westwood because uh, Larry Niven wanted to have a chance to sit down with him and, and, and talk to him. Um, and while I was there, I kind of poured out my heart about my career and my collaborating and wondering whether or not I was, you know, collaborating in order to survive in the field and trying to, trying to make it, you know, for almost 20 years, Octavia Butler and I were the only black science fiction writers in the world, as far as we could determine. I mean, Chip Delaney left the field. So it was unspeakably lonely, and I, I wondered whether or not I'd made compromises that would dull my my sense of 
my sensibility. So I, I kind of, you know, talked to him about this. And at one point he said, well, you know, have you published yet? And I said, oh, yeah, I've published, you know, eight, you know, five books and this and that and in these short stories. And he just started laughing at me. He said, oh, you'll have no problem at all. Um, the last time I saw Ray was just before he died. Um, there was a, an honorary, there was a, a thing that they did at the Universal Sheraton to celebrate his life. And they asked me if I would speak. And uh, he was in a wheelchair and he could barely speak. I'm not sure he could speak at all. Um, and I poured out my heart about how how valuable he had been and how much I had needed somebody to believe in me and, and, and to look at me and believe that I could have my dreams. And I was just crying like a baby. And, you know, I, I went over and I gave him a hug. And uh, about six weeks later, I got a note from him thanking me for speaking at the at his memorial, you know, shaky handwriting. It, 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 it was typed, I guess. Um, and the typing was a little, little rough. And he concluded the note by saying, some of your tears were my own. And he signed it, Ray Bradbury. And he died about two weeks later. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. You bet. Um, an important man, a good man. A, 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 an amazingly talented artist <laughs> yes absolutely you know and as far as i can as far as i can see the primary thing that he did was he he just kept in touch with the little boy inside him he read encyclopedically he wrote every day uh and he shared a lot and that is um typical of masters uh the masters that i have met in my life in any field they're always learning they're always teaching and they're always doing yeah. well i don't think there's any way to follow that up or top that Steve. no there probably that, isn't very, very much that that's you know i I've, i'm shaking uh, thinking about it thank I've you i've been very blessed with the quality of human beings that i have interacted with and who who were kind to me this is why i'm willing to take time like this because those people took time with me so this is just passing it on man i i've been blessed I appreciate it. You know, the idea of this whole project, too, is like, you know, I, there's a lot of really interesting people on this video. So I think a lot of people are going to watch it and that's fun. But this right here is the, is what's behind it. Like those people that are going to watch the video who are the smaller chunk that just love science fiction and love the history of it. They're going to hear your story and, it, and it's going to move them the way it just moved me right now. And Good. I appreciate it. it's going to be a celebration of great authors and great books. And, and, and I got nothing negative to say about, you know, the people in the field. I could say things. I know things. But who cares? Yeah. Everybody has flaws. Not everyone is magnificent. So I would prefer to focus on what is magnificent about these people, these men and women, um, because it speaks to what all of us could do if we believed in ourselves more and followed our passion more and um, wanted to share our light with the world. No, 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 yes. Kat Rambo is an author of a number of phenomenal books, including her most recent release, You Sexy Thing. You know, I, I, I understand that you had the opportunity there to study with Octavia Butler as well. Is that I correct? Did. What was I that did. like? And she's, she's definitely somebody. In fact, uh, one of the stories that I wrote post-Clarion uh, amid the words of war is very heavily influenced by uh, hearing Octavia talk about one of her stories. And in fact, talking about Lilith's brood. Um, I, I have such fond memories of her. And uh, I was just thinking about her this morning. I was thinking about, uh, she had this deep resonant laugh uh, that I think uh, is, is one of the things that I always think about. Uh, the, one of the directors of the workshop had this wonderful little poodle named Luke and Luke would come in and he just adored Octavia, just loved her. And he would come in and in that sort of doggish way, he'd be so happy to see her that he just goes zoom, 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 zoom around the, the classroom. And she would just laugh at him as he was doing this. And I just, that's my favorite memory of her. Uh, she was just amazing, just amazing. If you haven't yet watched my top 210 science fiction books episode that I recently released, Check that out. You can see Kat Rambo there, and she's talking about Anthony Burgess's 
a clockwork orange. Also on the top 210 video, you can see Adam Roberts speaking about his wonderful book, Beta. Adam Roberts is the author of Beta, The This, The Thing Itself, Adam Robots, Jack Glass, and many, many more wonderful books. Are there uh, other classic, uh, particular classic titles? Obviously, Dune is in there, perhaps a foundation series. Are there other classic titles that really sort of spoke to you or that you find have you can recognize an influence from those or certain classic writers? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's of, of my generation, I suppose. But it, I, um, Philip K. Dick, let's say, or Ursula Le Guin, um, maybe James Tiptree, writers who do something really kind of penetrating that can scramble your head and make you see the world in a in a different way mm -hmm. but i've read so much science fiction i mean i've also written a, a history of science fiction uh, which was published by Polgrave, which is quite a large book because it's quite a big topic and to to write that i went you know i went back over all the stuff i read as a kid and filled in all the gaps in my reading and there's it, it's such a when the backlist is so capacious, there's so much fascinating stuff there. And a lot of it is is rubbish and is derivative and is kind of you know, extruded generic products. But even amongst the stuff that is written quickly for money, there's there are masterpieces. There are kind of moments that just still make the hairs on the back of my neck tingle or, or reconfigure how I think about about things. And the thing I love about Philip K. Dick actually is he he did he wrote for the money he wrote because he got a certain number of cents per word and wrote really quickly, and took amphetamines in the morning to get himself all keyed up, and then wrote really rapidly and then drank a bottle and a half of wine in the evening to calm himself down. It's not very good for your health living that way, and he didn't live very long, but it means that his writing has this immense kind of energy, this kind of a rush to it. He's not a great stylist, but he's got so such a kind of kineticism to the way he, he puts his stories together. And he's just buzzing with brilliant ideas and wonderful stuff. I'm gonna, I mean, do you like Philip K. Dick? Am I, am I on my own? Yeah, year? no. One of the things I love about his writing, too, is, you know, a lot of science fiction, as you know, it, it, it provokes these questions, examinations of humanity or, mm. or what could be or discovery. But with Dick, he always seems to present those questions and I think more so than almost anybody else I've read, he avoids giving you the answer. Like he really leaves it up, to, it seems to me, to the reader to determine for your, for themselves. And and I think that's, you know, that's something that I really appreciate in a reading experience because it, I think part of it is a trust, you know, the author having a trust that you can decide for yourself where to go with it. I mean, the yeah. structure is there, of course. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's exactly right, isn't it? And I think he was in his way, a kind of philosopher and it sounds a bit pretentious to describe him in those terms because he's also you know he's a, he's a writer he's an entertainer but there's something his books are in part about getting his reader to think about things from a new angle and to challenge your preconceptions but How also i mean i see you wearing i see you wearing a solaris t-shirt yes um, of course. Stanislaw lem. i mean lem, lem and dick make an interesting pairing because they hated one another and lem was very angry about dick and Dick was very paranoid about Lem. He thought Lem was a Soviet agent living in what was then Soviet Poland. Oh, really? But they're both writers who are prepared to do this kind of amazing thing where you, when you read a Stanislaw Lem novel, it's not like anything else. And it, it, it makes you, it, it blows your mind. I mean, I keep I'm, I'm repeating myself, but it's, it, it's, it's brilliant. It's wonderful. There's nothing like that, I think, in, yeah. in mainstream conventional fiction. It's such a power and you can tell that they appreciate, especially with Lem, he, could, he appreciated having that power to make you think. Mm. Gareth Powell is an award-winning author. He's the author of the acclaimed Embers of War, the author of Ack, Ack, McGack, and his newest release, Stars and Bones. Are there any authors who have influenced you as a writer or impacted or influenced your writing career? I think probably the author who had the biggest influence was William Gibson. Um, I always wanted to be a writer and I was trying to write sort of Star Trek style um, adventures and very um, cliched stuff based on the 60s authors I've been reading growing up. Um, and then I read Ben Crone by William Gibson and that just opened my eyes to a completely different way of writing. You didn't have to write about hyper-competent captains and scientists. You could write about ordinary people on the street. Um, and you could take the language down to some deceptively simple, yet sort of poetic and Raymond Chandler 
level. So, yeah, I'd say Gibson really kickstarted my career. I'm sure Greg Bear needs no introduction. He is the author of Blood Music, Eon, and many other really great classic science fiction novels. He appeared a number of times on my top 210 episode to speak about Isaac Asimov and his work on the Extended Foundation trilogy. And here he is. I asked him a few questions about authors that influenced him or dazzled him. And here's what he had to say. Is there an author or authors who influenced you as a writer or has influenced or impacted your writing career? You know, I'm not sure uh, any of the writers from that time period influenced me because I was reading them and gathering up all the information I could about them and the field and publishing. And uh, so, you know, everyone from Ray Bradbury to Arthur C. Clarke to Isaac Asimov to Robert Heinlein to uh, the usual group to Paul Anderson, uh, who I was reading The High Crusade. Uh, when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, thought that was amazing. And also later read um, his fantasy novel uh, and, and just totally loved his connection between science fiction and fantasy. He was one of the many that were actually writing both, Elspray DeCamp, Paul Anderson, and I thought that was the way to go. And, and it turned out not to be so true now for me, but, but back in, when I got started, I was writing both science fiction and fantasy. What science fiction authors dazzle you? <laughs> Today, a lot. There's a lot of young writers who are doing really amazing work. And uh, I won't name the wall because I'll probably forget somebody. But uh, back in the day, the people who really dazzled me, I kept going back and forth between Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury. And along the way, I ran into Frederick Pohl and, uh, and uh, just so many others, John Brunner, I, you know, again, I'm going to use too many names. I was reading hundreds of books at that time. And the paperback revolution was really important to me because I could afford them. There were a few that I could pick up each week. And, and I did that. I still have many of them here. And, uh, you know, that, that was probably the richest period of science fiction and fantasy for me was about the time that uh, the Tolkien books were being released. Lord of the Rings and so on by Ballantyne and Ballantyne's publishing arm was amazing. And so, you know, by the time Tor came along, uh, was, that was my generation. And that was shortly before it all took off again. Steve Bellinger is the author of a really great time travel story that I read this year, The Chronicar. And I also asked him about his influences. That's amazing. It, it, it was such an enjoyable read, and I, I hopefully, I, I hope millions of people do read it because it is really one of the great time travel novels that I've read, among many that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, what authors dazzle you in science fiction? Well, again, um, keep in mind that I've been around for a long time. Um, I first was introduced to science fiction by my mom, uh, raised by a single mom who worked uh, at a printing company and she would bring home books for us to read. And one of the first science fiction books I read was iRobot by uh, Isaac Asimov. So I would have to say Asimov, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Heinlein, all of the old classics, those are the guys that uh, really do it for me. Now I will admit that I did enjoy the Ender series by uh, Arthur C. or by um, Orson Card. Orson, Orson Scott Card, thank you. And uh, I also like uh, Kurt Vonnegut, but my interest goes all the way back even to H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. Yeah, all the all those great classics, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. I, Robot, and uh, Ender's Game were some of my earliest introductions as well, and just made me fall in love. Yeah, I literally just started reading I, Robot again this week. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I did it last year and it's just you know just it's one of those ones that i feel like you could probably go back to every few years and never get absolutely time. is there an author that influenced you or impacted your career as a writer i would again have to say isaac asimov um he has a tendency to start with real science and then extrapolate from there um th there is a definition of science fiction that i like to use uh, and in it, uh, well, the science, well, the definition goes that in science fiction, the science, whether real or imaginary, has to be so central to the story that without it, the story would fall apart. Now, I would have sworn I had heard, read this uh, as said by Asimov, but I have yet to find the person who made that quote. So 
I'm claiming it for myself. Uh, but um, I would say Isaac Asimov, and then maybe after that, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, only because, again, they were some of the pioneers. And these were men who were scientists themselves. So they started off with real science and would extrapolate in a way that was very believable. Wole Talabi is one of my favorite authors of short fiction, and he had a number of authors to speak about when I asked him about his influences. Wole, are there any authors that have impacted or influenced you as an author or your writing career? Yes. So similar to the first question, there are a lot, actually, because I'm constantly influenced by what I read, right? We're all you know, an, an iteration of all the things that have come before us, right? We are constantly absorbing and reinterpreting and reusing. Um, in terms of my own specific writing and career, there have been several people that have, that have um, influenced me over time. And from, you know, very young childhood till even more recently now. I'd say in the early my early um, years and my sense of, you know, storytelling and what makes a good story and what I enjoy. If I could narrow it down, I'd probably say um, people like Isaac, Isaac Asimov was very influential for me, um, not just his fiction, but also his nonfiction. I read the uh, biographical encyclopedia of science and technology when I was 12, maybe. And um, that probably influenced not just my writing, but also my career, how I ended up becoming an engineer, um, because I found that very fascinating. And then um, some Nigerian authors like Cyprian Ekwensi um, in particular, who wrote what, you know, back then they were not classified as such. It was just called, you know, African literature broadly. But what he wrote was definitely pulp adventure fiction. Um, mostly based on legends and myths from Northern and Central Nigeria. And I loved his stories. They were wildly entertaining, always full of interesting, fascinating characters and, you know, fantastical elements as well. There was always magic, you know, in the stories, but they were mostly adventure stories and you know, with strong emotional cores like romance and revenge, like the classic big, you know, epic stories of the day. Um, so yeah, Super Inequency, Isaac Asimov. And then as I got a bit older, um, probably more influenced by people like Ursula K. Le Guin, because I just love how creative she is um, in every aspect of her writing. And that's something I've learned from and taken a lot from. If you watched the 210 video, you saw Greg Baer talk about Isaac Asimov. Here's an extended version of what he talked about on that video. And to see the recent TV show, it's not necessarily the foundation I was aware uh, uh, was reading, but it's still a fantastic job. And I thought they did an amazing job on the foundation series. What, what do you think it is about foundation that it today is still considered one of the great, I mean, there's so many great classic science fiction books, but a few are, are remain with high popularity, like Dune and, and foundation. Why is foundation a novel that has really stood the test of time and, and is still just as, amazing now as it was back then well in the 1950s it was well published and uh and available and in the 1960s it was part of the science fiction book club so everyone had access to it and it was very well done isaac started writing it in the late teen years i believe and uh john campbell uh was helping him both with that and with the robot series and uh, and you know that was a very interesting time period uh Isaac was was combining history and his reading. Um, I have a set of books that he also had on, on the history of the world. Uh, and he was reading it all. And he had an a, 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 a eidetic memory. So what he was reading stuck with him. And he would put bits and pieces of it into his stories. But really what he was doing was he was kind of echoing what we saw with uh, uh, Gibbon on the history of the Roman Empire and following through on that in a science fiction context. There may have also been bits of uh, 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 Spengler. There was certainly Spengler influence on, on uh, science fiction writers otherwise, uh, and possibly even Toynbee. But, you know, as, as teenagers, we didn't read all that just yet. 
but through Isaac, we discovered it, and that expanded our historical range. And uh, and Isaac also start, was writing a lot of nonfiction books at that point in the 1960s, and uh, had stopped writing uh, fiction mostly. So when he came back with uh, with his science fiction, we were there for it, and and uh, he was already kind of a master, uh, and he was editing a lot of anthologies, uh, Hugo winning anthologies, and so on. And uh, we would read those from the library and elsewhere, and just kind of he he became our our entrance point, one of the entrance points, uh, along with a lot of other editors like uh, Leo Margulis, Margulis and and other writers who were editors who are putting together a lot of anthologies at the time that uh, that were pretty amazing but but you know we also read the robot stories by Isaac and there was always a theory behind the robot stories it's interesting that it wasn't Isaac who necessarily found that theory or the three laws of robotics it was John Campbell Jr and that that was an interesting time period for Isaac I when I got my first autograph from Isaac I handed him a copy of iRobot and, and had him sign the page with the three laws. And uh, I thought that was a very crucial moment. And those three laws have still echoed down Every, everything from, uh, from you know, robot stories on outer limits and so on to, to uh, the Cameron robot stories, which it seemed to me were kind of influenced by the three laws, although not necessarily following through on them and possibly uh, expostulating on the the tragedy of failing to follow the three laws. Yeah, it's amazing. We see it in Star Trek too. I recently, and I don't know if you've read Sea of Rust by uh, C. Robert Cargill. You, you see the three laws in that. It's really amazing. That yeah, yeah. Isaac, Isaac's influence is is still. You know, we had a lovely moment uh, when I was president of Sefwa. We got together for a seder in New York City at the Pennsylvania Hotel, and. Uh, uh, and sat with Isaac and uh, and a number of other people there, uh, Julie Schwartz, who was an old time fan and comic book editor and great friend, and all these people gathering together and, and eating the, the Seder food and thoroughly enjoying Isaac's commentary. And, you know, I wish I had known him better, but uh, there was an interesting point when I was writing the, uh, the Second Foundation uh, mm -hmm. series with Ben and uh, Brennan Benford that uh, I, Harlan Ellison called and said to me, you know, I was gonna call Isaac and ask what his scientific thoughts were on this idea I've been having. And I realized I can't, he's gone. So I'm calling you instead. And there, a voice kind of popped up in my head and I'm gonna do a bad imitation here. But the voice said, so Harlan, how can I help you? And that was kind of weird, you know, cause Isaac did not believe in an afterlife. And yet here I was, in a sense, kind of channeling him to help write this new series. And it was it was a real honor to do it. Larry Niven and Jeremy Purnell are perhaps the most legendary writing duo in the history of science fiction. One of my favorite moments in the top 210 video was listening to Stephen Barnes talk about his experience writing with Niven and Purnell and their work on the legacy of Herod. If you missed it, here he is again talking about that experience. Well, I mean, you're talking about, you know, Larry and Jerry, who especially at the time this book was written were beyond the shadow of a doubt, the best writing team in the world and some science fiction, or at least qualify, would qualify as candidates for that. Um, I certainly brought my own skills and energy to it, but I think that my task was to study their thought patterns and their voice as much as possible and try to produce something that felt like something that they would produce filtered through my own sensibilities. Um, every, I wrote, I did the first draft on most of it, although they were very, very involved. And as as soon as I produced first draft, they would tear it apart and, 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 and work with it extensively. Um, but I think that, so Jerry had what I'd call the kill switch in the sense that he was, he was driving everything um, and evaluating everything. And I got my marching orders for, from, from Jerry uh, in, in almost every way. 
Um, so he went over everything carefully about tone in terms of pacing, you know, um, I, I could take a little bit of credit that, that the pacing of things was something that I was looking at very carefully, but I would want to be very, very clear that I was absolutely the junior partner there, that I was in a learning position. I was in an acolyte position, an apprentice position. And if I did a fine job, which I think it was, um, I, you know, I, I credit these two wonderful men who gave me the opportunity. If I stepped up to the plate and hit a home run, that's great. But I still was part of a team and everybody was bringing their A game and we were having a lot of fun, but working very, very hard. So I, you know, that's, that's the closest I could come to trying to explain why it worked. Legendary author, award-winning author, Ian McDonald also appeared on the top 210 episode. He is the author of The Dervish House and the author of River of Gods. What science fiction author or authors dazzle you? Oh, um, gosh, that's a, that's a difficult question because it changes all the time. Um, for about the past five years, every year I've been reading, rereading Samuel R. Delaney's Stars in My Pocket Like, uh, like Grains of Sand. Because I think it was Joe Walton described as kind of pop, uh, it's kind of kind uh, of pop rocks for the imagination, and it it still fizzes. What he does with language, what he does with kind of information, what he does with gender, is is still very very interesting. And and I, and I kind of I'm kind of dazzled by his writing style. Um, A new to me author that I was excited to discover this year was Rachel Aux. And it was really interesting to hear about the impact that Robert Heinlein's Starship Trooper had on her. I understand you have a special relationship, and you mentioned previously that Robert Heinlein is a, a, a favorite classic author. You have a special relationship with the book Starship Troopers. I do. So I've always enjoyed it. Um, Starship Troopers is one of those legendary military sci-fi books that has a love-hate readership, you know, the haters say it's, you know, war worship and, and, you know, blessing the military and all this stuff and the lovers, you know, or the opposite. They're saying, well, no, it, it just shows humanity's compulsion to fight, you know, that it, it just is kind of revealing an ugly element of what it is to be human. Uh, so, it, it, you know, and who knows what Heinlein was really trying to get across, but yeah, I, I love it because like all the Heinlein stuff, I feel like it's pretty layered that he's trying to bring out, um, you know, he's he's definitely does philosophical, psychological themes within the books, even though it's hidden under the action and adventure and, and storylines. And, and so it's one of those books that you can, you know, after a chapter, you just be like, oh, wait, that wasn't just a battle or that wasn't just basic training it you know it really really shows you what it means to be human so i um i loved it and a friend of mine jamie mcfarlane who also writes science fiction he's also a fan of starship troopers and so when we we're gabbing one day we we're like hey well we both enjoy this book and one of my favorite parts is the basic training component he's like mine too wouldn't it be cool to do our own little you know series with that has basic training within a few of the chapters and i'm like brilliant and so we did that and and we uh pushed out the space trooper series i think about a year ago and and just had a blast that was a lot of fun that's great yeah i'm looking forward to picking that up now after hearing you talk about it thank you for watching i'm michael leverts and this is fit to be read